no one has a brain like yours, and nor will they ever again. They might have hearts like yours, and lungs like yours, and livers like yours, but why is the brain so special? And why does it make you so special? Because it is special. Over the last 18 months, I've been traveling quite a lot. Um, I've been working on two new books, and I've been doing my research in Oxford on Alzheimer's disease and on mechanisms that I think might be important in looking at the impact of technology on the brain. So if you're living in this instant world of strong senses, what about empathy? Now, we all know that there's this thing called happy slapping, which is truly monstrous, where you show on YouTube people being physically or mentally bullied or hurt. What kind of people do this? Could it be not so much their sadists, but simply they don't understand, they are no longer empathizing with what it feels like to be hurt? There is an increase um, in people with autistic spectrum disorder. Um, there are issues with um, happy slapping, for example, and uh, evidence that would suggest of people not being able to empathize well. Um, in the rise of the appeal of Twitter, for example, of um, the flood of consciousness of what one's doing, I think these are all indirect measures that people's attitudes to each other and to themselves could be changing. When people say there's no evidence or what would be the evidence, one can turn that back and say, well, what kind of evidence do you imagine there could be? You know, are we going to have to wait 10 or 20 years and see that people are different from previous generations, which is one possibility? Are we going to look at the rise in prescriptions for various drugs? That's another possibility which we can do, but that's of course indirect. And also that sometimes for the kinds of issues we're looking at, you can't just go into a lab and get evidence overnight very quickly in a lab-based, rigorous, empirical way. The number of times people have come up and talked to me about their concerns from parents and teachers, I would regard that as evidence in a way, although obviously it's not rigorous. So I think that there's enough pointers that we should be talking about this rather than fretting about not being able to replicate things in a lab in an instant way. The big issue is what will happen if the environment changes? If, as I hope I've persuaded you, the brain is exquisitely sensitive, as the human brain is, to the human environment, if the environment is changing in unprecedented ways, might we not be changing also in unprecedented ways? The big question is, is it for better or for worse? on what's going to happen, not whether it will change or not, because that's what brains do. They will adapt to any environment they're in. There's a recent review by someone called Bavalier um, in a high-impact high journal called Neuron, and she says in the review that this is a given, that the brain will change. Um, she also reviews evidence showing there's a change in violence, distraction and addiction in, ch in children linked to the um, pervasion of technology. So. Um, there is increasingly, the more work has been put on, the more evidence is growing. The reason I arrived at the hypothesis was rooted in the fact that I know human brains change to the environment, the environment's changing. I didn't say, and I've been misquoted universally, that it rots the brain and it's bad. I've never given value judgments, ever. It's more that one starts with the plasticity of the brain for which there is massive evidence, increasing evidence, um, and makes that natural deduction. Just look at this, 900 hours between a child's 10th and 11th birthdays that are spent in class. 1,300 hours with their family, just under, and get that, just under 2,000 hours in front of a screen. In the old days, when television was first introduced in the 1950s, and people were concerned that kids wouldn't read books as much as they were going to, and there's some professional parents I still know who actually don't have television. You know, so that's not to say that that was good and this is bad, but more it's a question of degree. Um, television, as, I, as I've just said when, uh, in this talk, you know, when I was a kid, that was the centre of the home, rather like the Victorian piano was. It's a very different use of a television when you're sitting around arguing and talking and enjoying it from going up to your room and spending till three in the morning on your own, focusing on a screen. Yeah, you know, there is a big difference in that. So it's not so much the technologies in and of themselves that I'm criticising, it's how they're used and the extent to which they're used. And my own view is that these modern technologies are excluding people doing other things. If you're spending six hours a day or more, Doing that, that six hours a day is not going for a walk, not giving someone a hug, not feeling the sun on your face. You know, you, you can't multitask those things, you're either doing one thing or you're doing the other. It's my view that if these technologies are harnessed properly and we think about it and talk about it and decide what we want from these technologies, we shouldn't say what's going to happen in the future. We should say, how are we going to shape the future? And above all, how are we going to give ourselves and more importantly, the next generation, a strong sense of identity and fulfillment?